Welcome, folks. This is a joint meeting of House Health Care Committee as well as House Corrections and Institutions Committee. And we had a joint meeting a long time ago, which was the first week of the session. Really? Yeah. Seems, seems like, like a long time ago. <laughs> it's like four months ago, yeah. not four weeks ago. Um, yeah. We're going to continue our that meeting, um, we had scheduled at that previous meeting to hear from our contractor who provides health care services um, in our correctional system, our correctional facilities here in Vermont, WellPAT, so uh, entity we contract out. They were on Zoom and uh, waiting for us, and we just didn't have the time because we spent the bulk of our time talking with DOC for folks to get an understanding of how healthcare services are delivered within a correctional setting, which is a little different than out in the community. Um, so we've scheduled today to hear from uh, the contractor that the state contracts with. And um, we're going to start with Max Titus, Titus, Titus. Um, who's the Director of Health and Wellness for the Department of Corrections, and we have Jessica's Chairman, yep. who is here, who's the regional vice president of WellPAT. And I don't know if you both want to come up at the same time. How do you want to do this? Uh, this is not a, I was saying chair. Okay. Okay. Why don't you come on up? That table seems so. I know. <laughs> <way>. <laughs> my glasses i know Max. <laughs> so man <laughs> sorry we're so far away <laughs> are you okay down there <laughs> but you're okay yeah yeah it's fine so if you can introduce yourself max and give us just what your role is and also the how doc enters into a contract what the process is because we have a bidding process um and how long the contract is for the cost and what is covered Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Max Titus. I'm the Director of Health and Wellness for the Department of Corrections. Um, I can start with a broad overview and then zoom in or answer questions as needed. Um, so as you know, we our current model for providing health care in corrections um, is uh, through a contract with an outside vendor. Um, our current vendor is WellPath. Um, we are in our seventh month with our contract um, currently. Um, that started in July of last year. Um, and there is a, an extensive process that we go through. So that, um, the contract um, was about 18 months into our process of getting a new vendor. And so that planning process started um, early in 2022. Um, that process essentially starts with us looking at our current model, uh, looking at the system that we have, um, looking at the resources and determining if any of the alternatives um, out there um, are something we want to pursue. Um, for example, some states and some jurisdictions um, do a contract model like we do. Some um, employ uh, state staff that provide the direct care. Uh, some partner with um, outside uh, systems to come in and provide the care. And some do a combination of all of those things. Um, so at that time in uh, January of 2022, um, the department decided um, to move forward with our current model, which was to go out to uh, bid for a new contract, um, knowing that we were planning for uh, 18 months in the future. Um, <clears throat> so our team uh, essentially spent a ton of time um, with our RFP to make sure that it included uh, the expectations of what we were looking for in our system. And we view it as our team at DOC um, builds and sets the expectation of what the system will look like and the vendor is implementing and providing the care as part of that system. Um, so we released the RFP in mid-2022. Uh, we received two bids, um, both from private or profit healthcare companies um, that specialize or specifically provide healthcare and correctional settings. Um, based on a, a lengthy review uh, of that, uh, of both vendors' materials, uh, we um, did interviews of both vendors, uh, did research and media and legal histories on both. <coughs> we determined that, that WellPath um, was the vendor we were gonna move forward with contract negotiations. 
Um, and then we engaged in the discussion about the details of uh, the scope of the contract, the financial provisions, and any conversations about uh, state language that's included um, in all of the contract. Um, so that uh, process um, concludes with an agreement between both parties of what we anticipate the contract to look like. And then from there, there's a state review process where it goes through various state agencies uh, for approval. Uh, the intent is that the contract started on July 1st, um, which it did, a lengthy transition period work that goes into that actual takeover that happens um, 90 days and, and further in advance of the contract itself. Um, so we um, consider that pre-90 days plus the first three to six months of any contract as transitionary. Uh, a new vendor is really coming on. Um, they're onboarding and training staff. Uh, they're recruiting for vacant positions. Uh, they're learning the system, they're learning how we do things in corrections uh, in Vermont, and then they're assessing uh, what, what needs to be done um, to improve the system or to bring it to the contract expectations that we have of them. Um, so that brings us about to where we're at now, which is um, we've just sort of shifted into a, an on phase with WellPath, um, and we've um, been focusing on a change management plan, which is a requirement of their contract. Essentially, they spent the first six months assessing the current system um, by a contract requirement and determining um, where in our system we are meeting those expectations already or what changes may need to happen for us to get there um, to achieve essentially our desired state uh, of health system. Um, so that brings us to essentially where we're at and covers the bid process and, and the contract negotiation process. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit about the specific contract structure and then answer some of the questions that were posed in the last testimony mm -hmm. about the financial provisions that you guys didn't get into. Um, do you want me to pause for a yep. And before you go there, I know we have a question for a member. John? When you review an RF, uh, the bids, when, they, when the two come in, do you um, keep the price concealed until you've reviewed all their aspects and then look at the price last? Uh, so we predetermine uh, criteria for scoring of the materials that are presented as part of their proposal. Uh, we don't keep the price uh, confidential until after, um, but it's scored separately. Um, and our financial director is a part of that conversation as well. Um, essentially, we have a team of individuals that come from mostly uh, the health services team at DOC, uh, plus some operational folks, financial folks, um, and folks in different divisions that uh, come together, review all of the content uh, of the proposal, essentially all the services that the vendors are proposing to provide uh, to meet our requirements. Um, and then we have a separate conversation about the financial aspects, which factors into the decision. And then we have a, a, another conversation about the IT components, which is uh, they bring their own network uh, to our facility. So there's an ADS component too. Did WellPath appear to have the lowest price? Um, that's a good question. The cost in this, I don't remember the exact numbers. Uh, the cost for the two bidders that we got in this last bid was very uh, similar. It's very close. Okay. All right, and then Mary, and then we'll continue with your testimony. Thank you. Um, this is coming from a uh, nurse, uh, healthcare worker. Um, what standards um, does the Cor Department of Corrections and or WellPath use? What model of care um, do you follow? Do you follow na a national standards like the National Commission on Correctional Health? Um, and did you use sta a, a minimum standard of care for correctional health care to evaluate WellPath um, and to continue to um, assess um, quality and safety in an, in an ongoing way. Yes. Um, and actually, I was going to speak to that, but I'll just go into it now, so that's good. Um, so our contract is structured around the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare Standards. All of, uh, it's a requirement of WellPath to ensure that all of our facilities are accredited, um, and we have been accredited for many years uh, through multiple contract terms. Um, that is a baseline, uh, what we consider like a minimum standard of care, um, and we actually, in our contract, uh, although it's structured in the same like uh, title format as NCCHD standards, 
within each of those, we include Vermont specific requirements that go above and beyond the NCCHC standard. And then we have a, an additional section at the, the front of the contract at the, at the beginning um, that goes into any Vermont specific requirements that aren't already included, including uh, uh, minimum like staffing levels in certain areas, um, human resource requirements, et cetera. Um, Is that so that, you could share with us? Sure, the, the contract you mean? Yeah, um, yeah in electronically. Yeah, can you make a note? So we have one more question. <laughs> Mary, and then the other two. <laughs> so we bid on this, what highlighted low cap as being the getting the contract. Were there certain services they could provide that the other couldn't, or how did that come about? That's a good question. Um, so obviously, I mentioned we we had a scoring process um, with predetermined criteria. Um, that was specific to um, the actual bid materials and what the vendors were able to provide. Um, in in that case, it was it was relatively similar um, between the two parties. So we really relied heavily on the interview process with the vendor. Um, one of the things that was really important to us uh, as a health services monitoring team was making sure it was really clear uh, what our philosophy was about the care that's provided uh, within our facilities. Um, there's this uh, term, it's commonly called correctional health care, um, and we actually were up front and talked in our interviews with our vendors about, um, or with the bidders, uh, about our philosophy that we are not providing, quote unquote, correctional health care. We are providing health care that happens to be in a correctional facility, um, and that was the, the like core value of our discussion with the um, with the bidders was about philosophy and whether the philosophy of the the vendor aligned with what we're looking to do. So I would say that was the, the primary difference. Uh, so when you went through this process, do does the wellness team or whatever your team is called work with BDH, Department of Health, Department of Mental Health, DIVA, the other agencies within Agency of Human Services that provide and monitor and do insurance for healthcare? Is there a collaboration there at all? Or are they involved at all in the process of selecting a vendor or monitoring and providing the oversight of the vendor? Uh, yes, good questions. Um, so they are involved in the, uh, I would say in general, they're involved in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, we work uh, with the other departments within AHS frequently. Um, it, for example, it's a requirement yeah. that the uh, vendor uh, have a drug formulary that's as closely aligned with the Medicaid preferred drug list. Um, so we are working with the other departments to determine what is the community standard. How do we build that into our contract language to make it clear? Um, it, you know, during that process, during bid process, we, we typically try and include a representative from uh, another department and other divisions to have um, that voice there. And if, if they're not included in the specific scoring aspects, they're consulted as part of Great. Thank you. you know, we're going to hold. So write it down. We're going to let Max continue. Okay, I'm going to continue on because I also realized I didn't answer the CQI portion of your question. So I was going to talk about that anyway. Um, so there is an additional section of the contract that is devoted to how we as a monitoring team um, uh, oversee the services that are provided and then how we're able to follow up with the vendor to make changes and impact that change process. Um, so WellPath as any uh, healthcare entity has their own CQI process, and I'll let Dr. Sherman talk more about that. Um, but we require that our team is a part of that process um, along with them, um, and that we are able to bring to that discussion any areas of concern that we have. Um, the contract uh, requires us to have a monthly meeting and a committee, um, and there's a whole process outlined about how that happens. Um, and the contract also ties uh, liquidated damages, which I'll talk about when I get to the financial more. Um, so essentially we can withhold funds um, if the contractor is not engaging in that process with us as it's outlined. Um, Max, I think it would be important to, to talk about what the cost of the contract is. Sure. Yeah, I can just give us the, the dollar amount that we pay for it. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> to specifically answer that question, um, there's, there's two answers. There's a, a per individual per month rate that we look to, um, but essentially it comes out for year one, um, around 34.7 million um, is the total contract uh, uh, budget. And then for year two, 
um, it's 38.1 million. And for year three, um, it's 40.6 million. Um, and uh, that is based upon uh, during the contract negotiations process, the vendor brings a budget um, with their proposal of what they propose it will cost to provide the services that we're requesting. Um, that budget is broken down by sections um, that include everything from uh, staff costs and benefits to pens and pencils. Um, it's broken down and itemized um, in, in the way that you would anticipate uh, um, like a healthcare organization. Um, and so that um, PIPM is determined during the negotiation process. Um, and we refer to it frequently, but it's the, and I want to be clear, it's the basis of the negotiated amount that is paid to the <laughs> vendor. Um, once it is signed and the contract is done, that per individual per month rate does not change based on the daily fluctuations uh, that we have with the number of individuals. So during the negotiations, we determined an estimated uh, in-state population would be 1250. And that's how we calculate um, that PIPM times 1250 um, is how we get the amount that we pay WellPath um, on a monthly basis. It is the same amount each month um, and it's been determined. It doesn't vary unless we go outside of a range of average daily population, and then we would renegotiate that. Can you tell us what the rate is? So yeah, for year one, it's um, two thousand two hundred fifty-three uh, and thirty-three cents. Uh, for year two, and this would be in the document I share, by the way. So um, it's two thousand four hundred seventy-six dollars and eighty-one cents. And for year three, it's $2,636.74. Great. Do you have a question? Uh, Wayne? So those are pretty su substantial increases from year to year. What's driving that? Um, so that's part of the proposed budget. Um, the cost of healthcare continues to rise. Um, the cost of staff. Um, and the reliance on agency staff when you don't have full-time staff um, has increased over the years. So we add into that budget. Um, I guess we don't. WellPath does, but then we can you know, talk about that during the negotiations. An amount that, that seems reasonable for what they anticipate the cost of supplies and staff uh, and other increases from year to year. Seems, seems pretty substantial increase. That's projected out. Into the future, and yeah, you're locked. And, you, and you're locked into a contract with that. We are, and we have terms that that allow us to renegotiate if there's a substantial change in either the service or the conditions of the system. And can I just follow up? And if the cost is more, do yes. You... Let me talk about that. Yeah. So, and then we'll go to Art for your question. We oftentimes, and I think this came up in the last uh, testimony when my colleague was here, um, get questions or comments about contracting with a for-profit vendor. Um, the question tends to come up of how would that, or would it impact care, and if so, how? Um, so uh, our team has <laughs> considerations when we look at uh, uh, the vendor and the cost model. And so for the last several uh, contracts, we have included language to try and address that issue and to make sure that um, providing less care does not incentivize additional funding for the vendor. Um, so our contract requires uh, that pre-agreed upon budget and a year in reconciliation every contract year. Um, at the end of each contract year, WellPath has to provide their actuals broken down um, and compared and mapped to the budget that was uh, originally agreed upon. If their actuals are less than the budgeted amount for that contract year, uh, the difference is returned to the state and it becomes state funds again it's used at our discretion. Um, if at the end of that contract year, we actually have spent more in actuals than what the contract was budgeted, there's language that requires like a shared risk. Uh, the first 3% of the overage is paid for by WellPath. Um, the second 3%, so 4 to 6% is paid for by the state. And if we're over 6% over our budget amount, we negotiate uh, based on the circumstance. Um, so essentially, if WellPath provided less care and didn't spend as much money on it, they don't keep the money. It comes back <clears throat> to the state. Has that ever happened? Uh, Could you repeat yes, the question? 
Can you repeat the question was, has that ever happened? Not in this, uh, not in this contract or the last one, but in previous contracts, um, there were times where savings were returned to the state. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I, when a contract like well <laughs> comes in, you know, they came in lock, stock, and barrel, I guess, to, to do this work. Do they bring equipment with them, supplies, or, or do we provide everything that they need to do the work? Or is it just people? It's not just people. Um, so we obviously provide the space um, and we provide um, equipment to the extent, uh, like the beds, for example, DOC pays for the bed. So in infirmaries, when there's a hospital bed, DOC purchases those. Um, we, we provide anything that's property of the state um, WellPath does bring in um, office furniture and uh, specific medical equipment that they may subcontract with for a uh, vendor to provide on site. Um, and Dr. Sherman can speak to the details of what, uh, what other equipment they bring in, um, but they also are bringing in an, an IT network. So even though they're working in our facilities, they're not using the state's network, they bring their own oh. IT network into the facilities. Their staff are working on their own network. Um, so there's a, there's an ADS component to it. Um, they're uh, bringing obviously staff and they're also bringing um, like subcontract uh, services that might come in as well. And how about like personal gear, all the personal gear yep. is there? All of, the, uh, all of the medical supplies, medications, anything that's needed for the actual provisions. Is there yes. to provide? Yep. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep. So we have another question, John. With our contract down in Tallahatchie, does that include healthcare or does WellPath play a role down in Mississippi? The contract with WellPath is just in state. Um, the contract out of state, which is not my area of expertise, does include the healthcare portion of the folks that are out of state. Do you have much more? Are you? Uh, I have a couple more financial things I wanted to mention just about the, the contract. So we also include, I'm, uh, I might have mentioned liquidated damages as part of our. CQI process. Um, essentially, that is a uh, predetermined and agreed upon rate uh, that our team can deduct from any invoice uh, when we have determined that the contractor is not fulfilling the terms of the contract and not engaging in the process to improve. Um, those liquidated damages um, are deducted and cannot be recouped at a later time. Um, so if it's if it's uh, if we deduct from the invoice, the well path doesn't have the opportunity to earn it back. Um, we also have holdbacks, um, which we can use anytime we haven't received all of the documentation or information we need to verify that WorldPath has, has complied with the contract. Um, we can hold 5% back from each invoice. Um, <clears throat> on the flip side, we also have um, payment incentives um, for a certain performance. So we have a list of uh, performance metrics uh, that depending on the, the threshold of performance by WellPath on each of those metrics, they can earn an additional up to additional 3% on top of what we have determined as the, the year budget. Um, and so those are calculated on a monthly basis and added to the contract when, when funds are released. Um, so I think that's, those are important aspects and you can talk more about that if you want, but just wanted you to be aware. Um, I think generally I'll just say, um, when we're looking at the system in corrections, it's important to consider it in context with the, the larger health system in Vermont. We're just a part of a larger health system. Um, and what we often see in corrections, um, as Commissioner Stimmel and Levine noted last year in their op-ed, mirrors and magnifies the challenges that are seen in the community. Um, we are seeing generally uh, an older and sicker population, um, people that have a lot of health needs um, and are challenging to care for them. Um, so I think that's important to consider. I have some stats on, um, you know, percentages with chronic illnesses, um, the percentage of MAT, you know, things like that, if, if you want me to speak to us, but I know you have time. We have a lot more questions here. So. Okay. <laughs> we have Mary and Chip and Tristan. Michelle. Michelle, I thought yeah. it was Leslie. Okay. And Connor. Okay. I saw a hand over there. Mary. My question was somewhat answered. Oh. Okay, Chip. Thank you. Um, so you can, I think you characterize the process um, as a negotiation with WellPath in order to forward the process here. Um, my question is, uh, 
Is there a vetting process as well as a negotiation, or is that part of a negotiation? Is there a separate vetting process? And how might that work? Um, can you say what you mean by vetting process? Well, I guess look into the practices and history of the of, uh, the potential uh, provider and um, see if you can recognize anything good or bad about their practices and free, yep. uh, that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, The um, so the negotiation process is, is strictly after we've made a decision to move forward and the vetting process happens prior to that during the um, bid review process. So once we've uh, reviewed the materials, interviewed the vendors, had internal discussions, um, we do reference checks. Um, so the vendors providing references to us. Um, we also do other uh, background and research. Um, and I can defer to Isaac, who I think was involved in that process, um, to look into you know, media history, uh, legal history. Um, all of those things are required uh, as part of the, the bid submission for the vendor to provide us their uh, litigation history and um, and essentially that information. And then we do our own checks of that as well. That happens before the negotiations. Then we, when we make our decision, then we shift into negotiations where we're talking one-on-one -on -one with the vendor about the terms of the contract. Does the provider have to be licensed in Vermont in order to uh, obtain this contract? So the contract is really a comprehensive services. Each individual who is providing service under that contract is licensed just like any community provider would be. So the medical providers are licensed medical providers in Vermont. The nurses uh, are registered nurses. Thank you. Tristan, Michelle, and Connor. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that there's some reassurance that there's an incentive. There's not, there's not an incentive to withhold health care is, is the intention of the contract. That seems clear. Um, it doesn't seem clear that there's an incentive to get people healthier or, um, and if you looked at performance-based ways of actually asking to, given the many challenges of the, of the population the DOC is serving, what well, path is serving, to uh, look at population measures like hypertension, diabetes, and try to uh, rein those numbers in or get people healthier. Yeah, it's a good question. So I mentioned very briefly the pay for performance metrics. So we have a predetermined list of metrics, uh, which are a combination of things that are interested, uh, interest of our monitoring team, um, as well as metrics that were uh, originated through like HEDIS measure, measures, which is like a, uh, you know, a well-known uh, hospital metrics. Um, and then we've also uh, consult with our VDH or DIVA partners to talk about um, metrics that might make sense um, as well. So that is incentive dollars, um, which is intended to be um, that if the vendor achieves certain outcomes um, beyond what's required by the contract, then they are uh, getting additional funding. How much? Uh, it's up to 3% of the total contract. Thanks. Michelle and then Connor? Um, yeah, so my, my question. Then we're going to go to WellPath, so we make sure we get to that today. <laughs> my question is related to that as well, actually. You talked about liquidated damages and incentives. And I'm wondering, so it's actually two questions. The first part is, um, how often is that calculated? Do, like, do you look quarterly? Do you look annually? How long do, do you take to look at potential damages or incentives and then figure that things are either going well or not? So that's the first question. The second question is, could you give some examples of what that looks like? You know, are we talking about, you know, fewer heart attacks over a long period, or like just if you could give some examples of what would what would qualify as an incentive and also particularly like what would qualify as as when damages would happen because that feels like a useful thing for us to know. Sure, yeah. So they're calculated monthly um, because they're tied to each monthly invoice. Um, and I, I mentioned, I think briefly, but it's, uh, it's worth noting that that liquidated damage is essentially a rate based on the amount of time that, like, physically, like the actual amount of time it takes our team uh, to resolve whatever issue it is that we have. Uh, so, if we, if our team collectively spends uh, ten hours in a month to resolve an issue that we're not getting uh, what we need from the vendor, then we would say ten hours times that pre-negotiated amount, which I don't have um, off the top of my head, um, and then that would be deducted from the invoice that month. Um, so that's how it works. Uh, so it's just based on how much time they take to address an issue, not what the outcome is of the issue. That's how much time our team has to spend to resolve the issue. 
um, when, uh, so essentially it's like if we've assigned a timeline and they don't meet the timeline uh, and it takes our team four hours of conversations and following up or whatever to get uh, the resolution that we need, then we charge four hours times our rate. And then what about the incentives? And on the incentive, I, um, I don't want to quote the specifics, but um, we have the uh, metrics that we could provide the, uh, the description and numerator denominator for you. But is it also about time or are there? Uh, some of them are based on uh, uh, the threshold of meeting uh, time, timelines that we've expected. Some of them are about um, discharge planning and the percentage of individuals that are receiving certain elements of discharge planning mm -hmm. at release. Um, there's, uh, I think, 26 metrics. Yeah. Connor and then John. Uh, thanks very much, Max. I let my questions answered already with some of the guardrails uh, in the contract. And uh, I'm just kind of trying to balance in my mind, like, what's realistic versus what's acceptable, right? And in my mind, you know, having like a private equity firm care for people in our custody, still subject to like bottom line objectives and shareholders. I, I just don't like it, you know, it, it sits wrong with me. Um, but realistically, you know, I've seen the cost models, right, of how much it would cost to bring in-house I know that, like, prison health care doesn't get great press generally, no matter who's providing it. Uh, but at the same time, we're the oversight committee, right? And, and it's a gnarly Google search. Well, path, it is. It's, you know, somebody at Springfield whose license has been, like, suspended in three states. It's uh, inmates getting the wrong medicine. And it, it's tough, I think, when constituents call because it feels like there's a level of detachment, you know, when it's a private contract versus more in-house work where it could be more accountable, more oversight to it. So I guess the question is like, um, you know, I'm looking at the cost analysis and it has 204 full-time positions for state employees. The first question would be, do we have 204 Wellpath employees on the ground right now? And then you kind of mentioned like looking at other models. And, and I think it's interesting because like the state hospital, the best state employees do work, but they partner with the tertiary hospital who's providing some of the functions at the top end there. So, like, have you considered those models? I, I wonder, like, you know, if you ask Fletcher Allen, hey, here's $40 million, could we work out a deal or something? Would that be a conversation starter, designated agencies with mental health? So I'm just wondering, like, so going forward, like, it's, it might be acceptable now, but long term, do we want to move in another direction? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I understand your question to be, like, how how have we considered other models in the past? Um, and And... To what extent? Um, so I'll say we, uh, I mentioned before in the, the bid process, that's always the first step before we decide to put out, to go through that process. It takes a lot of time and effort. Um, we consider it. Um, and each time we go through that bid pro process, and then sometimes in addition to that, we do have these conversations. Uh, I think the last time, I'm looking to Isaac to make sure I get the number right, but the last time we did an estimate of what it would cost to do it um, strictly in state, uh, the number was more than double what our annual contract with Wellpath is now. I think it was upwards of 80 million. Um, and, you know, that is based on uh, all the things that go into employing state staff versus a private entity employing staff, um, the ability for vendors to get uh, negotiated rates that are lower than what we may be able to get because they're doing large, uh, like national scale business, um, things like that. Um, we do consider that. We consider partnerships. Um, the challenge is, uh, we experience the same challenges that the community system does with staffing um, and being able to hire and, um, and retain staff. Um, WellPath has a lot of uh, resources in recruitment and being able to hire and onboard staff um, in ways that would be challenging, I think, for our the in state to, to do based on the resources that we have here. Um, uh, so I think there are some operational challenges that we consider as part of it as well. We have approached community uh, health systems and providers and had some of those conversations about the DAs, um, EVM health system, for example. Um, and none of those conversations have ever worn, um, have ever resulted in the outside entity wanting to be a partner of ours. Um, and so I think once we do get into detailed conversation, people start to understand how complicated it is um, and how complex it is and difficult it is to, to retain, to hire and retain staff and to provide service at this level. Thanks, Max. John? I'll follow up on Representative Oslin's question on liquidity damages. 
When you mentioned it, my mind immediately went to, okay, well, for an example, a diabetic, it's a foot infection, it's not treated properly, and it results in, in hospitalization or worse. From your description, it didn't sound like that was part of the equation. Yeah, it could be. So if we had uh, heard of that and uh, identified based on it that there was an, a, um, a deficiency in care provided, um, that uh, you know was an issue of, of the vendors, um, we would engage them in that CQI process that's outlined in the contract. Um, essentially, it, it allows our team to gather as much information as we need to really evaluate the, the issue um, and then designate that we've identified a deficiency that needs to be resolved with a plan. Um, if WellPath is agreeable and makes the changes necessary, um, we would not engage uh, liquidated damages. Um, however, if we don't get the response or the change in practice that we're looking for um, within the timelines that have been set, um, then we would engage the liquidated damages for that. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, Max, I, when you send the contract, and which I'm assuming is where the metrics are that you've talked about, um, if you can point those out, and if you could also include any um, results to date that you've had with WellPath, so we can just see what the what the has been and what the oversight is. That would be great. Thank you for your testimony. Sure. Thank you. Ready, Jessica? Why don't you come on up into the hot seat? But you've been warmed up. <laughs> Welcome. Yes. And if you could identify yourself for the record. And you've also heard some of the um, focus of some of the questions, <clears throat> but um, we'd also like to hear in terms of how WellPath sees delivery of services within a healthcare situation. Um, maybe also explain a day-to-day -day operation of what occurs in a facility um, with your medical staff, what they encounter, what they see coming in for services, how it gets resolved, how it doesn't get resolved. That might be helpful for the committee to have a perspective of what's occurring within our facilities. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Jessica Sherman. I'm the regional vice president um, for the WellPath contract here in Vermont. Um, our services, we provide comprehensive medical and dental and psychiatry, behavioral health, um, nursing. Um, we contract with audiologists, ophthalmologists. Um, we provide physical therapy, radiology, um, just about any kind of service we can provide on site, we will do so. Um, if we are unable to provide that service on site, we, we contract with um, community providers to set them up with, say, a specialty care like um, a cardiologist or endocrine, and then we will follow that plan of care that that provider had set forth for us. <clears throat> um, each site um, has a medical clinic. So um, just kind of give you an overview of how each site is run. Um, they have their, each site has their own leadership. Um, they have what's called a health service administrator. Um, that person is the administrative oversight of the clinic. They um, have a licensure, they may be have a licensure or certification in, in, in healthcare, but they may also have a degree in healthcare management. Um, most of our HSAs are nurses, although they don't have to be nurses to be in that role. The HSA is the administrative oversight, so they are the liaison for that site between the medical department and their site DOC. So they meet um, daily with the superintendent and um, other members of the DOC on that site to review um, medical cases that um, they need to know about, like if somebody is going out for an appointment or maybe there's somebody in the hospital, um, they would give updates on you know when they're planning on coming back. Maybe they have a patient in the infirmary, um, talk details about when they could be released and go back into their um, housing unit. Um, the HSA also provides just overall ensuring that the day-to-day -day for the staff on site is um, 
that they can do their job. So providing that support and ensuring that supplies are ordered, um, ensuring that their staff is supported in um, getting medications ordered. Um, they also do a lot of like peopling. So if there's conflict between um, staff, then they would help resolve that. Um, next in line after the HSA, so everybody on the site ultimately re reports to that HSA. Um, next is the director of nursing. Each site has a director of nursing. They're the clinical oversight of the nurses. <clears throat> um, they focus on orientation, training. Um, they also focus on patient care. They help us with our CQI processes and making sure that it it's getting to the set, the frontline staff. Um, so it's not just a meeting that Max and I have, it gets, it gets to the HSA and it gets to the DON to be able to implement at the staff level. Um, they also are clinical, so they may fill in for some of the vacant shifts if, if necessary. Um, they also, um, you know, are able to resolve conflict amongst team members. Um, they see patients themselves. Um, we also have what's called a health service coordinator. Um, they are, most of our health service coordinators are LNAs, although you don't have to be an LNA. Um, they are busy usually scheduling outside appointments for our incarcerated individuals. So they um, take what is given to them from our providers and they put it into our utilization management system for um, referral and approval, and then they set up the appointments um, for the incarcerated individuals who go out and have their appointment. They also help with discharge planning. Um, they can be clinical if they're an LNA and help on the floor. They also, I kind of refer to them as the glue to keep, that keeps everybody together because um, they are the ones that kind of also help order the supplies and whatnot to make sure that we are um, have everything we need to be able to do our things. Um, we have nursing, um, we have medical providers, we have psychiatry, we have mental health at every, <laughs> at every facility. Um, we have dental chairs at four of the six facilities and the two facilities that don't have dental chairs, they have um, transports twice a month um, to what I like to call as their sister site. So Marble Valley and Rutland goes to Springfield and, and um, Northeast and St. Johnsbury goes to, to Newport. Um, day to day, um, meds are a large part of, of what our nursing staff does. We deliver about 10,000 medications, 10,000 pills a day in the state um, to our incarcerated population. Um, so we have nurses that are dedicated to Medline. Um, they have specific times of the day that we do Medline at each site. It's based on um, working with the security side um, is why every site might not have the same time. So it's based on security flow. Um, so we provide meds. The nurses also do what's called sick call. So if a um, incarcerated individual has an acute complaint, um, they are able to put in what we call is a sick slip. The sick slip is entered into a centralized location um, within their dorm, and then a nurse comes around and picks them up at midnight. Sure. They read them um, and triage them if it's an urgent thing. Like sometimes people actually put on sick slips, I have chest pain. Um, so in the middle of the night, they will go to that individual and assess their chest pain. But if it's something as, you know, I have um, a hangnail, I have back pain, I want to be seen by the provider. Um, those things are triaged and the nurse will see them face to face within 24 hours of receipt of that sick call. They will use the WellPath nursing guidelines to take care of that patient up to the scope of their practice. And then if they are unable to treat them based on their scope, then they would be referred to the on-site provider. Um, nurses are also very involved in site level on wound care um, treatments. They do um, um, like nebulizer treatments. Um, they're also in our booking area where the intakes come in. They do um, that medical intake that 
spoke mm -hmm. about that is very lengthy process. They'll do that medical intake. Um, they're also out there with our patients that are coming in and out for um, quick, if we have people that come in that are actively detoxing or, you know, um, there for a short period to sober up, they are monitoring those patients as well. Um, we have for medical providers, we have a um, majority of a um, majority mid-level providers. So we have nurse practitioners and physicians assistants. Um, we do have a doctor coming down to Southern um, in a couple months. Um, we are, once that doctor arrives, we'll be fully staffed with, with providers. Um, the providers day to day, um, we, the nursing staff will set them up with a with a list of patients to see based <laughs> on when they were seen last, basically. So the providers are doing what's called an initial health and physical that has to be done within seven days of being admitted into the incarcerated setting. Um, after that, their annual health or periodic health and physical is based on their age. So the older you are, the more frequently we're going to see you. So it might be every year, it might be every two years, every three years based on your age. Um, we also have what's called um, a CIC, which is a chronic care um, visit. That is, you know, we've determined um, in your initial HMP, we realize that you have maybe diabetes or heart disease. We're going to have you have a, an initial chronic care visit at that time. And then we are gonna manage your chronic care condition. Um, they typically in the beginning might see them more frequently, but it's usually a three, 30, 60 or 90 day um, rotation. Most, um, once, we're, once you're stable with that chronic condition, um, they would put them on the 90 day rotation. So they're seeing those patients and then we're popping in those, those sick calls um, throughout the day as well. If everything is, is moving, um, as if we have, we're working with our <laughs> Department of Corrections counterparts. So um, as long as um, patient movement isn't altered, our um, providers can see anywhere from 15 to 20 individuals a day. Um, we also have dental. Um, dental follows the same process with initial and, and periodic reviews. Um, assessments and sick call. There's dental sick call. Um, they are they have to be seen by a dental um, provider within 30 days of admission into the into the incarcerated setting. Um, typically, during the initial um, health and physical, or the nurse seeing them upon medical intake, they will do an oral exam to see if there's anything that would require them to be seen quicker. Um, we have psychiatry at all of our sites. Um, our psychiatric providers are nurse practitioners. Uh, we have um, use remote psychiatry for majority of our of our facilities. We do have two facilities where um, the provider comes in person uh, at least once or twice a week. Um, but our psychiatry is done remotely. We do have. Um, folks who will set up the um, telepsych for the individual and um, they call them up, they set them up, they wait for them to be done and then they, they bring the next person out. Um, mental health is, you know, they have also parameters that we follow based on NCCHC guidelines. Once the, somebody comes into the facility, they have to be seen within seven days. Um, they, once they're put on the mental health list, um, they also have those periodic reviews that could go 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, same with psychiatry based on their med um, requirements. You wanna stop? I do think we have a couple of questions. Okay. So we're gonna start with Art and Mari. Oh. Melanie and then Connor and Daisy. And me. <laughs> and Leslie. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm first. Uh, how, how many overall visits do you see, I guess, let's say in a month <laughs> or a year? I mean, how many interactions with patients that are sick or have probably, I, if you check somebody in when they first get there, I get that. 
But how many times are people going to the infirmary? I mean, do you have data on that or maybe you don't know? Well, the infirmary is different than our medical suite. Um, so each, so we have like a clinic, like a primary care clinic, basically. Oh, you do. So we act as like a primary care, urgent care in our clinic. And then Southern, Northern, um, and um, Chittenden have, an infirmary, which is for a higher level of care. Okay, so a clinic, every facility has a clinic? Every facility has a clinic. And, but every facility doesn't have an infirmary? No, if we have a, an individual that is got healthcare needs that are, that would be not hospital level care, but not, they aren't able to care for them in their current facility because they need infirmary level care. Um, the DOC transfers them typically to Southern State to because an, they to have an nine. Infirmary. Yeah, to an infirmary. Okay, so how many? So I guess my question would be, how many visits to clinics do we see in the course of a year, a month, or some indices so we get an idea of volume? We, we do have that data on that. Yeah, okay. right. you figure it out. It has to be today. I just wanted to get a sense of. Right. of what we're talking about here. Yeah, just, yeah. just to give a, an idea of context. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> sorry. The monthly average sick calls is about 3,400 sick calls across the state. How many? Did you say 3,400? 3,400. Monthly. And the average monthly, monthly uh, number of provider yeah. visits is over 1,000. A little over 1,000. Per month. Per month. Per month. What was that last one? Provider visits. So okay, what's that mean? So provider <clears throat> is medical. Is that where are you just counting medical? So medical provider visits. Okay, so you got thirty four hundred going to the clinic, and then beyond that, you've got a thousand that are on that are being seen by the provider for their H and P or their chronic care visit. Okay. Is that thousand part of the thirty four hundred? No, that's what that's uh, separate. That's what that's yeah. That's the nurse the sick calls I meant. Is it's and and that is not unique individuals. That could be one person coming in ten times. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, colleagues. Oh, in the past. Fletcher <laughs> yeah. Allen was called Fletcher Allen. Yes. <laughs> um, can we, I have two questions. First one is remind me who who does the triage when there's a, a stick slip? The nurse. A nurse. A registered nurse. Um, a registered nurse will or an LPN. Or an LPN. An LPN is doing the triage and the call and RN has to sign off on it. Okay. Um, and does WellPath provide or do facilities, any of the facilities have point of care testing like EK, EKGs when someone's having chest pain, um, diagnostic imaging, ultrasound, um, things that can be transmitted for interpretation by a qualified provider and lab sampling, for example, yes, therapeutic so medication we, levels. Yeah, we do a phlebotomy on site and we send labs out. The labs come back and providers will, um, you know, interpret, interpret the them. results. Um, we do have um, radiology that comes in to the sites when there is a need. Um, and then there is a um, part of that service is somebody that reads and interprets that. Um, and the provider can also read and, and read e that. EKGs as well. EKGs, we have um, an EKG machine in every clinic. And a qualified provider can read that immediately for... Okay. Um, and then can you give us an update on the progress you're making around um, hep the hepatitis C issue? Um, can you be more specific? So there was a um, uh, a case, and I don't know if you want to dive into this one. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Jess, uh, but there was an issue um, with hepatitis C levels. Um. I think you might be referring to a, a, a settlement agreement that was in place related yes. to this. That, uh, actually, that agreement has ended. Um, I think we're closing out our reports for that agreement. Uh, our policy 
uh, is the same as uh, what was agreed upon with that, uh, which I think was in 2021, um, hasn't changed. Uh, the challenge with uh, treatment for HIV um, is really around um, the determining someone's length of stay and the amount of time that's with us for us to be able to do the workup uh, to determine the treatment that's appropriate uh, and then provide the eight to 12 weeks of actual medication and then monitor afterwards. Um, so our policy and, and, uh, addresses um, how we factor in knowingly stay into uh, clinical decisions. And then there's specifics in the policy around folks that are treated uh, regardless of length of stay uh, that meet certain clinical uh, clinical thresholds of disease. Um, so our policy is, is unchanged. Our monitoring has continued since. The screening. Yep. So I've heard something. Um, if it's screened positive, they're uh, like any other CIC process, they're followed by the health provider. Uh, the, the additional lab work and, and uh, workup that's needed to determine treatment um, occurs. And there's a review month to month, um, which is part of our policy. <laughs> Stay and how that may the uh, and thank the. Uh, I did receive uh, well, shortly after I asked for the contract, so I appreciate um, that that was was sent along with a bunch of other documents. So thank you, Melanie. I believe I heard you saying that health service coordinators within the um, hospital or within the corrections be sometimes outsourced to other specialists or sister sites. I'm wondering how many times that happens. And um, is the billing for that? Melanie, can you speak up a little bit? Oh, yeah, sorry, is the billing done for that through the negotiated contract or is that another, do all the and providers get great spelling, how much they get of that, their reimbursement? Um, I can't need. speak to the reimbursement, yeah. um, but the, yes, yeah, so we do, we use outside community providers for specialty services. And there's data on how many times we have, we have um, I can get it. It would be in our utilization management system, but we do send our, our incarcerated individuals out for specialty service quite mm -hmm. often. And then you spoke about psychiatry being done remotely and on mm -hmm. telehealth. Um, I'm curious if there is any in-person counseling, if you could speak to what happens for mental health care in the facility. Again, Melanie, we need to speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's a really long table. Yeah. Um, you spoke about psychiatry being done remotely and like telehealth counseling, and I'm just wondering if you could speak to what is done within the facility person to person. For mental yes, so we do have mental health, um, licensed mental health clinicians on site. Mm -hmm. um, we also have rostered as well, um, over, whose oversight is from the licensed folks. Um, so each site has mental health counselors. They do one-on-one -on -one sessions with individuals and they do groups. All right, so I have Connor, Daisy, Leslie, Wayne, Tristan, and then we're gonna go to Vermont Department of Health. Connor. All right, thanks, doctor. I, no worries if you don't have it on you. Um, was hoping you could just maybe provide the committee with some of the staffing numbers, total staff on the ground, administrative versus medical, Who's doing telework? You know, how many of Vermonters would be interested in? And then I just wondered, like, you know, it's a tough gig, right? Like, we have trouble recruiting COs and we have trouble recruiting healthcare workers. So, having somebody provide healthcare in a facility, that's a heavy lift, right? What are some of the strategies for recruitment that you use? So, uh, WellPath does have a robust recruitment team. And I would just like to say that, if, you know, we're, we work for WellPath, but we're all Vermonters. You know, so we're all people. We didn't come from That's what was some saying. secret well path thing. Um, <laughs> we, we are all Vermonters. So, you know, born and I'm born and raised here. So we're all Vermonters. Um, we do reach out, you know, for the sites that are closer to the borders. We do get um, um, stretch our recruitment strategies out to New Hampshire, um, into New York. Um, we have even for Newport started trying to recruit up in Canada. Um, um, there, and there's a, can't remember the town right above that. Um, so we have one, when we first started the contract, we had four recruit, recruiters dedicated to Vermont from um, WellPath. Um, in that time, um, when we transitioned from, from Vital Corps to WellPath on July 1, we had um, 
significant um, agency usage, um, travel nurse usage, um, especially in Newport and in um, Southern State and Northwest um, and Chittenden. <laughs> yes. um, so th four of the six sites had substantial use of, of agency use. Um, since their recruitment model has come in, um, we have been able to, um, we no longer have agency usage at Chittenden in the women's facility. Um, we are close. We have about four FTEs, three FTEs left at Northwest for nursing to replace agency with. Um, about four at Northern as well. And Southern, um, we have... Um, we are, we were about 80% agency when we switched over. I would say we're probably down to about 60% now, um, at Southern. Um, recruitment strategies that they have been using, um, when we, you know, try to trans, um, convert agency staff members that have been here for a long time, um, some of the agency that have been working with corrections have been working with corrections in Vermont for years. So um, getting them to convert to WellPass um, has and we've been successful with a handful of agency staff um, that have decided to convert to WellPass. Um, we, we also, you know, go to students in, um, in the nursing programs. So we try to get clinical, um, clinical um, placements. Yes, clinical placements, thank you. Um, with with nursing students, nurse practitioner students, so that we can recruit from from that as well, because that's really where you need to start. Um, they've been doing a lot better job of reaching out to people. They've been doing a better job of um, you know making sure that those posts are on Indeed. Um, and they've been also our recruitment has also been helping with uh, trying to. Um, support the on-site leadership and tactics with interviewing and making sure that we have the right bodies and the right seats. Doctor. Thank you. Uh, Daisy? I apologize. I'll try to be quick. Um, Melanie kind of got at a bit of my question around psychiatry and portion of it being via telehealth versus in person. So I'll try to focus on my questions around quality access and outcome standards. Um, given that the general population is approximately 18% of us have been diagnosed with mental illnesses versus I've seen statistics as high as 45 to 50% of the incarcerated population being diagnosed with mental illnesses. Um, what can you say about what WellPath is doing to maintain, I guess, parity with the standards of access, quality, and outcomes that we have here in the general population come to expect from our mental health providers. What can we do to maintain that for people who are in the justice system? Yeah, um, we do um, <laughs> so we have mental health clinicians at each site physically on site who see patients one-on-one um, -on -one. Um, we do a lot of groups that um, are, and we follow curriculum um, that is approved by Annie um, at the DOC. <laughs> um, so we follow that curriculum um, when we do groups and one-on-one -on -one, um, counseling. Um, we do have at least, um, each site has, you know, depending on the, the, the number of folks within that facility, they have a matrix based on what they need for mental health. Um, we have been recruiting mental health as just as heavily as we've been trying to recruit for nursing and have made some gains there, um, same transition as well. Um, as far as the psychiatry goes, um, it was, and why we do telehealth, it was actually easier for us to recruit and find um, psychiatry services um, remotely than it was for us to find people who are willing to come into the site physically. 
<laughs> Thank you uh, very much, Leslie Goldman from Healthcare. Um, I was a little surprised at 10,000 pills a day. That's a lot of medicine being yeah. moved yeah. the system. And I'm wondering, it seems like a great opportunity for error, not just because I worked in the medical system, so I get it. And I'm just wondering what processes you have for prevent for dis dispensing and preventing error. That's and then once error happens, how do you handle it? Because yeah. it's inevitable. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so we have an electronic health record that we follow um, for medication dispensing. Um, we order medications through a vendor called Diamond um, when they come in that we, you know, count and account for. Um, when the incarcerated individuals come up for their medications at the window, we do, you know, name, date of birth. Um, all incarcerated have a, 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 a wristband um, that we check that with. Um, if they don't have their wristband, they have to go back and get it. So they come to you. They so you're not us. going to them. So that's one step. We would go to them if they were in a custody situation that required us to go to them because they're not allowed to leave the area they're in. Or if there is a lockdown in the system and we have to go unit to unit. But otherwise, they come to us. Um, so using the five, six rights of medication is how nurses would go through that process, ensuring that they have the correct med, having the correct person in front of them before they distribute it. Um, we do have med errors. I mean, as you said, it's inevitable with 10,000 pills being passed a day. Um, we have with WellPass what's called um, a critical event process. So when a med error happens, um, and actually any kind of critical event that happens goes through this process. So if somebody's sent to the ER, if um, uh, an incarcerated individual injury, if there's a med error, any kind of event like that, it goes through this process um, that goes straight to our, our lead um, CQI people in WellPath at the corporate level who do a lot of reviewing of our charts and such. Um, but it also comes to me, it comes to our regional director of nursing, um, and our medical director as well. So when a med error occurs, once the error is discovered, they have to notify the provider um, who's there on site. If it's off hours, then they would notify um, via on-call um, the provider on site or whoever's covering statewide. If additional monitoring is necessary, we would bring that patient um, into an area closer to medical if there's no infirmary. Um, so usually booking is right off of medical. They might stay in booking for the night um, so that we can monitor more closely or they would be in the infirmary so we can monitor more closely. Um, after they've, you know, been deemed safe to go back to their housing unit, they would go back. Um, I notify um, Max and, and their team when a med error occurs that requires further monitoring so that they're aware. Um, the on-site DOC is also aware. Um, once we get that med error in, we do a, a root cause analysis of sorts to figure out the reason why that error occurred. Um, sometimes it, it's you no know, five rights weren't followed. Sometimes you know it, we realize that maybe there's there's rushing at the window, so we know that we have to slow the process down. Um, sometimes it's directly related to pharmacy and how they distribute the meds. So we would go through that root cause analysis. We would have education with the nurse involved um, for sure. Um, and we would document that education plan. We would also take that as not an example and point out the nurse, but use it at, probably as an educational moment in a staff meeting or whatever to say, hey, you know, this situation occurred. Um, these are some things we learned from it to, you know, keep your, um, to have a learning lesson from it. So how many med errors do you have a month? Oh, gosh. Um, you can get back to us. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's a number you don't want yeah, to. Yeah, I'm sure you have it on your head. Uh, yeah. Med errors are a lot a result of culture or, or reporting of med errors. Many don't, you know, get hidden because people are afraid of consequences. Yep. I don't know what your system's like, and I know we want to move on, but I, that's a concern. Yeah. yeah. We, we take an educational approach first and foremost. And when you do those, that breakdown, how many med errors in a month? 
It might be good to look at which facilities break it down by. Yeah, we, we get that data through that system, that tracking system. It can break it down by um, facility, time of day, that kind of stuff. And I think that's just a good reminder that um, this is, as someone said, I think as Max said earlier, this is a, a acute population. They have high health care needs. So. All right, we're gonna keep asking questions and may not get to Kelly. Um, Wayne? I'd like to flip the script a little bit. <clears throat> so we're giving almost 10 pills a day for every inmate that we have in prison. And it's very convenient to get medical, to go and see someone. Like for me, if I have to drive to Burlington or St. Albans, eh, uh, you know, I don't go very often. So, right. so it's very convenient to get the services that are being provided. And it's costing us a good bit north of $2,000 a month per patient for, for care. So of all these people coming in, and I have an aunt, she died some years ago. She was 97 when she died. She was a hypochondriac for her, her whole life and what she was doing. She'd go into doctors to get attention. And you can understand, I could see that in prison, you know, you're bored. Uh, how much, you know, might you go and seek services because you're bored rather than having this, a legitimate issue? So do you have any controls on that in any way so that, um, you know, we're not being taken advantage of? I mean, our providers are certified educated providers, so they um, do have, you know, autonomy to prescribe how they choose. Um, but they they do know the population that they're working with, um, and can and know people, um, especially those who have been in the system for a while who are you know are coming back and back and back to medical. Um, so I would say that they are they're not prescribing for the sake of prescribing. I understand the concern. Yes, and and I just want to reiterate what Jessica just said. I mean, they are licensed healthcare professionals that have to follow the rules of Vermont. So it was the one my aunt was went to for years and years. <laughs> Tristan Roberts, a um, couple of related questions about medically assisted treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, do our inmates typically think prescribed Subutex or Suboxone? They're on the monotherapy, so um, Subutex. And is there anything to that? Um, cost currently, um, but we have been exploring the other option. Um, I just my concern would be that that's not as effective in helping people avoid. Um, you know, they can get high in other narcotics with subutex. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know a lot of people are trans. Yeah, we need Tristan. We need you to speak up. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so. Subutex, you know, you can still get high in other narcotics with that. So there's a concern, but it's less effective. Still okay, can't hear you. Yeah. It's a big room. Okay. Yeah. Up. If you have to stand up, stand for it. <laughs> um, I'll just go to my next question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. Just... Um, no, uh, thank you for the encouragement. Uh, do you provide, you know, part of MAT standard of care, I believe, is uh, counseling and recovery support. Does WellPath provide that? Yes. And to what extent? Um, we have MAT case managers at every facility. Um, they see the patients under medication assisted treatment um, one on one, and they do groups um, just based on guidelines and curriculum that um, has been put forth by the Health and Wellness um, Department of the Vermont DOC. Can you talk about the frequency of those subgroup supports? Or um, it it really depends on. Um, it does depend on space at the facility um, and what's allotted to them, but we do try to make sure that there are at least weekly groups um, happening at every site. Thank you. Uh, Brian Sheena, who is on uh, Zoom, so. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> does WellPath have any mechanism to work with community-based providers to continue care when someone becomes incarcerated. For example, if somebody has a long-standing relationship with a psychotherapist 
and they become incarcerated, is there any way for the person to continue their work with their existing provider? Um, I, no, no. But Thank we you. can, based on a, if we get um, an ROI from that individual, we can touch base with that provider um, to have their medical records and understand their treatment plan. You good, Brian? Yeah, but it, but it sounds like the person can't continue the therapeutic relationship with a provider who's already working for them. They would have to kind of hand their record over to to someone else to try to do that treatment. Is that a DOC or a well path requirement? That's um, I, it's based on insurance, isn't it? Yeah. Insure. Oh, right, because we can't do Medicaid or Medicare, right? Okay, thank you, Gina. Yeah, but well path could pay the person. I mean, WellPath could pay the person. The provider might not be able to bill the existing insurance. But, to, but anyway, thank, you answered the question, so thank you. I want to make space for the for others. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Go ahead, Gene. Yeah, so um, Gene Galfetti, representative, thank you. And I'm just trying to drill down on the 10,000 pills a day. I can't yeah, hear you. I'm just trying to drill down on the 10,000 pills per day. Um, what percentage, of, is that doses per day? Or actual pills, you know, I mean, it's kind of a, an ambiguous actual term. Pill. And then, so that's not including MAT. No, that's included. Met, so met. those are your sublingual films. So I just wanted to we be We don't clear. do films. You don't do the films. So all your no. subutex is, is based on pills. And to, you know, kind of dovetail on that, what are the controls that you have in place so that medication isn't being diverted? Um, well, diversion is really the security side. Yeah. Um, so there is an officer at the window, um, who will do mouth checks, uh, on individuals, um, meds that are able to be crushed. Um, we will crush and put into applesauce or water, depending on what the incarcerated individual prefers. Um, all of our mat meds, um, are crushed. Um, and there is quite an extensive for mat, our mat lines are separated separated from our general medication line. So that's its own medication line. Um, the medication is crushed, um, the individual receives it, and then they sit for 10 to 15 minutes to allow um, um, dissolving. And there is a, a correctional officer who is watching that process um, during that time. So it's an observed Time okay. frame of ensuring that it it melts and okay so out of the the ten thousand doses per day for pills however we're slicing that um what percentage of that would you say that are is mat doses versus just other medical conditions i didn't see the numbers today but we do have about 600 individuals on that okay so that accounts for a lot and my last question is if somebody's on a medication that's multiple times a day, what's the control if they forget to come to the window? Um, if they forget to come to the window or if they, um, if they forget to come to the window, if they come later, we will give them their meds. If they refuse to come to the window, then we have them sign a refusal. Right, but I'm saying more for somebody that it slipped their mind. Is there some sort of oversight in the computer system that says, you know, he takes blood pressure medication three times a day and he missed one of his doses simply because he forgot about it? Right. We do have a, a system in our electronic health record that um, allows us to flag when somebody has missed three doses of okay. a medication. Thank you. All right, so we have Topper and Chip, and then we're going to have to call it a day. Um, when, when I'm in prison, when I, uh, get out and I've served my sentence, what, um, what's the process to make sure that there's a smooth transition from inside to outside yep. in terms of the prescriptions I need and so on? So we do have, um, we do, Hopefully you're somebody who's sentenced and we know when you're leaving. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about when a judge says. Right. Um, so if we know you're leaving, it's quite easy, actually. Um, we would um, call providers in the community and set you up with appointments. 
Um, for your meds, we would um, uh, provide, so we tell our pharmacy, Diamond, that you're leaving and they send prescriptions to your preferred pharmacy for you to pick up. We would provide 30 days of medication, unless it's a map med, then we would provide to your next appointment. I wish it was working out that way. <laughs> it was only that easier. If it all right. Chip? So if I'm going to take up the tail end here, I'm going to be a little rough on you. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but um, to pick up on what Representative Casey had started about, uh, there was certainly skepticism around this table and in our legislative body about private for profit prisons and private for profit health care. And with some research, we discovered that um, uh, well, uh, WellPath is a subsidiary of a larger uh, uh, private equity company um, whose sole um, uh, motivation is to make a profit. And uh, you may or may not be aware of the letter that was drafted by a number of uh, Massachusetts senators and signed on by two of our congressional de delegation. <clears throat> regarding some of the investigations that they have done um, regarding uh, your organization. And I'll read from one paragraph that struck me and really disturbed me. And this is, uh, while WellPath asserts that it's not cost-cutting measures, that it's cost-cutting measures do not comp compromise uh, a quality of services. Extensive ed evidence suggests otherwise. Nationwide, the privatization of prison health care has been associated with instances of reduced quality of care, higher death rates, and less transparency. <laughs> the more the more recent trend toward private equity firms such as HIG Capital uh, Capital purchasing prison health care providers, along with food, commissary, and telecommunication providers, has supercharged the profit incentive to compromise uh, service quality. I found that really disturbing. And, uh, you know, from everything else that you read about this, it certainly seems to have merit because a lot of these senators put out a lot of time and effort uh, into, um, uh, into uh, uh, investigating this. So um, I guess I would ask you to comment on that maybe if you, if you choose to. I mean, I understand it's difficulty and it's more of a comment than, or a statement than a question, uh, but I just find it really disturbing. I mean, I did prisoners' rights many years ago um, and, you know, certainly healthcare, um, when Vermont was providing their own, was a subject of considerable um, complaints from inmates. Um, but uh, all throughout the, these articles, it, it just carries on about... Um, uh, various states that have uh, gained judgments and filed lawsuits uh, against uh, WellPath for um, inadequacy of care, uh, un uh, unlawful use of, um, of uh, restraints and, uh, and medical, uh, uh, medical uh, uh, subduing med with medical, uh, by medical means. And it just, it just doesn't sit well with me, I have to say. And I'm sorry to lay that on you, but <laughs> you're sitting in the hot seat, as they say. <laughs> Yeah, um, I can't speak to anything that's happened with WellPath in any other state. I know WellPath in Vermont. Um, and we are those who are providing direct care to the incarcerated individuals in Vermont are Vermonters. The nurse at the Medline is not thinking about, you know, cost savings. She's thinking about the patient in front of her. Um, and I can say that the the regional office in Vermont for WellPass, um, we advocate for healthcare to be what Vermont wants, what Vermont requires, what Vermont needs for our individuals. We, we believe in a, can a community standard of care. Um, and that is something that <clears throat> we will continue to advocate for um, regardless of whose name we're working for. Okay, as oversight, we'll be watching. <laughs> I have to tell you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Jessica. I just want to say thank you to you and all the nurses and medical staff who are working every day to support this population. Um, 
So thank you. I we know it's not easy. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep, we're done for now. <laughs>